This is Grape Video 44, Vineyard Design. In our previous videos, we talked about vineyard site selection, where to place your vineyard. And we're assuming now that you have located a parcel of land on which you're going to plant your vineyard. And we're going to talk now about what you do with that piece of property. It might look like this. What are you going to do? Where are you going to plant the vines? In what direction? How many? And so forth. We're going to talk about several things you need to consider before the planting can begin. Well, the first thing we'll talk about is decide what area is to be planted to grapevines. And there are several factors involved with that decision. The first is row orientation. In what direction will you plant your rows of grapevines? Well, the literature is very clear that most of the time the preferred orientation is a north-south orientation for sunlight interception. And that really has to do with getting relatively equal amounts of sunlight on the east and west sides of your trellis. If your vineyard is such that the canopy is not so dense but what sunlight can penetrate in both directions, the north-south orientation is not going to be as important as it is often stated in the literature. Topography can influence the decision. Oh yes it can. Look at this situation. Here we have a very steep slope and if we planted the grapevines in a north-south orientation on that steep slope we'd be planting them up and down that slope. Oh my gosh would that be a challenge to control the erosion. This is southwest Michigan we get three inches of rain on average every month of the year and we would have problems. So we're going to talk about controlling surface water a little later in this video. But in this case, planting vineyard rows north-south up and down that slope would probably be a big mistake. So we have very productive rows planted basically east to west here and it works just fine. Well, field dimensions can also alter the decision on the row orientation of your vineyard. Oh, yes, it can. Here's my fancy schematic showing a vineyard, and we'll say that up and down the page here is north-south, and if you insisted on doing that, can you imagine going down those rows with your tractor? You'd be spending half of your time just turning around at the ends of the rows. So it may make sense in this case to plant the vineyard east to west so that you have long rows that you can work more efficiently. Roads. What do we mean by roads? How do you get to the vineyard? How do you get in the area of the vineyard to work it in the first place? You need to consider that. Here's a schematic we used in a publication years ago and you can see that we've put in this drawing a farm road that gives you access to the vineyard sections. One and two is their numbered here. You need to consider how do you get to the vineyard. And I haven't put it in the schematic, but you see there's a woods on the left side here and on the right side. Well, you might want to a little access roadway along those woods to make it easier to get up and down from one end of the vineyard to the other without going through the vineyard at times. Headlands. What do we mean by headlands? Well those are the areas at both ends of the vineyard when you're working the rows with a tractor and they should be a minimum 
of 30 feet, or that is 9 meters, in order to turn your equipment around. And a little more would make it even more comfortable. I wish I had taken a picture a few weeks ago. I saw a vineyard that had about 20 foot headlands and then it went down a steep bank. I can't imagine how frustrated that grower must be every time he or she has to turn around and almost goes over the bank with his tractor. And recently I saw a vineyard where they didn't account for any headlands and they had to drive down the row and then back up that row, the whole length of the vineyard to get out because there was no headland room left at the ends of the rows. Once again, here's this schematic and you can see the words headland on both ends of those vineyard sections. Allow at least 30 feet minimum on both ends of the vineyard for equipment usage. Row length. How long can your rows be? Well, there's really no limitation in regard to engineering. You can make rows just as long as you'd like. Here is a picture I took many, many years ago in California. And when you talk about a vineyard row stretching to the horizon, uh, there are many, many vineyards in California like that. I've been told that at times people could be set at one end of the vineyard in the morning to start pruning and they would pick them up at the other end of the vineyard at the end of the day and a person would spend the whole day walking down one vineyard row pruning. In this case the Californians often do not transfer the stress of the wires to the ends of the rows with end posts and anchoring like we do uh, in the Midwest and in the East. So you can go on and on forever. But you can also do that long, long rows when you do put end posts and end post anchors. And we're going to talk about trellis construction in an upcoming video. Well, there may not be a limitation to row length in regard to engineering. But there could be a possible limitation in regard to efficiency of operation. That is, what about doing various types of handwork, whether it be pruning or suckering or tying, and you get people who are halfway down a very, very, very long row. How do they get in and out of the vineyard with efficiency? How do you get in and out of the vineyard when you're hand harvesting, for example, and you've got your equipment halfway down a very long row and something happens to the tractor. So you may want to limit row length based on the efficiency of doing tasks in the vineyard. Well the answer to creating efficient lengths of rows is to at times put a break in the vineyard and we call those alleyways. They should be a minimum of 25 feet wide, that is about 8 meters. Let's take a look at one. Well, here we are on a steep south-facing slope, and we have two vineyards separated by an alleyway right here. And it is about 25 feet wide. That allows us to work this area separately from this area. And it's much more efficient than if we were to not have that alleyway separating the two sections of vineyard. Logistics, another factor when deciding where to plant your vines. And what do I mean by that? Let's look at this situation. Where my old Oldsmobile is parked, there has been an area carved out by shortening these rows. And why did the grower do that? Because during harvest there's a lot of activity here and big semis
pull in along this headland and the grower needs an area to stage the loading of those semis with forklifts and then there's bins with trailers on them and the harvester itself and all those things would be in the way of the semis pulling in to be loaded so the grower has left this area purposely for staging the harvest activity so when you're planning and designing your vineyard think of all the activities that you're going to do through the year in your vineyard area and you may need to make some accommodation like this for some of that activity okay when you've done all those things that we've just talked about you can go in and put stakes in the corners of the area that you're going to plant. There's one, here's one here, and so on. And then we'll show how you measure that area and calculate the number of vines you're going to need. We'll get back to that in a little bit. But the second factor we're going to talk about in regard to vineyard design is the consideration of surface water flow. You know, if we consider most vineyards are planted on sloping surfaces with good topography, that can be a real problem in climates like the one that I'm in in Michigan when we have heavy rains and if you don't allow for that situation you could get into some real trouble. There are very good reasons and I'll refer you back to grape videos 40 and 41 why many excellent vineyards are planted on sloping ground. However in many viticultural regions Sloping ground also creates a need to control surface water flow. Oh boy, oh boy. Look at this wash that has occurred in this new vineyard planting. My goodness. A heavy rain came on this light soil and started to wash out tons and tons of topsoil. So it amazes me how much water falls on an acre or a hectare of ground during a heavy rainfall. Consider that one acre inch, one inch of water on an acre is 27,154 gallons. So on 10 acres, one inch rainfall is 271,000 gallons. That's two large, large Olympic swimming pools. And a two inch rainfall is half a million gallons and a three inch rainfall is 800,000 gallons on 10 acres. And boy, that amount of water can certainly do a lot of damage. If we look at a few metric statistics, a hectare times two and a half centimeters, which is an inch, is 253,000 liters and five hectares times a five centimeter rain or two inches is two and a half million liters of water falling on that ground. And if you're not prepared to deal with that water, some very nasty things can happen. Here is a new vineyard planted up and down the slope and the grower has worked the ground mechanically around the vines. And you can almost see the water troughs that he's created with his cultivation by working the ground this way. Oh my goodness. And that's what happened. That's what happened. I'm going to take a minute to go through a double speed video of what happened, but that water and the soil it carried in this particular situation went down a slope 
through a little woods area <laughs> that I'm walking through. It came out the other end of this little woods area, joined up with some more water flow from the other end of the vineyard, as you can see here, kept going downhill, and then it started going down the road. And this is after things were cleaned up somewhat, but it ran down the road, covered the road with almost a foot deep of sand and soil that has already been cleared away. This is just the mess that's left. So you don't want this to happen for many reasons. You have a big mess to clean up and you've lost very, very valuable topsoil needed for the fertility of your vineyard. So think it through about how you're going to manage surface earth. Here's another situation. This grower planted vines and this is the path of flow down the hill, but actually the flow is across like this. This is the straight downhill pattern of the water. And after this erosion started to happen, the grower went out and tried to put up these dams uh, with plastic and stakes. It doesn't work. The water flowed right through them, under them, and a lot of topsoil was lost here also. We have a situation in this case where there's a swale, a low spot, right here. And the water started to run down through that swale on this newly planted vineyard. So we went in with some bales of old straw to kind of hold back the water and break up the flow. Here's a situation that occurred several years ago. You can see this is a swale where the water is not only going to come directly downhill uh, from where we're standing, but it's going to collect from left to right as I put in that, in that red line drawing. And so what we wound up doing there is putting those stand-up pipes there and then putting dams of uh, hay bales to hold the water until we could stabilize it with the growth of some cover crops. Those stand-up pipes are actually connected underground with about a six inch plastic tile and we uh, do it somewhat like that and carry the water underground till it gets to the bottom of the slope and then let it flow out on a flat area at the bottom of the hill. When you have a very sloping ground, you may want to plant a cover crop and leave it partially in place while you're planting. The brown areas here are soybeans that were planted, Roundup resistant soybeans, and then drilled right over the top of them was a cover crop of a tall fescue. And in the spring when it was time for planting, instead of working up the whole ground, only strips were rotivated for planting of the vines to prevent a serious erosion problem. And it wound up looking like this. And it became a very productive Riesling vineyard. And you can see down in the swale that there are orange standpipes. That was the area that had begun to erode. But now we've got a place for the water to be caught up the hill and then transported underground down to the flat area by the barn. There they are right there. Here is a new vineyard planting and we're actually looking down slope. The tractor's going down the slope. And I put those red lines in there to show you where the rows of vines were planted, but um, that's just part of the story. Immediately after planting, immediately after planting, we're working up the row middles and sowing a sod 
so that we can begin to protect this slope from erosion. And later that summer, this is what it looked like. It looked kind of trashy, I, I, uh, I assure you that, I admit to that, but if we didn't get some cover planted here very quickly after planting, we would be very vulnerable to the kind of erosion that I showed you on some previous photos. Once again, that picture of uh, cultivation up and down the rows and what can happen. Oh dear. Well, enough of that. Another thing you can do at times is to plant strips of sod not only up and down the row middles, but between vines so that you break up the flow of water in two directions. Down the hill, in this case right to left, but also coming straight down the hill to us. And those are the areas where the posts were going to go. And it looks kind of trashy, admittedly, but safe against erosion to have those areas or where each of the line post is located with some grass sod. There's a telephoto shot. There's a close-up around each post. But after you go in and weed whip and clean those up and just shorten that grass, it's not so bad and you can be assured that you're not going to lose your topsoil during a big rain. Here's another situation in that same field where you can see the swale and we had some bags that had some old mulch in them from another project and we used those to interrupt the flow of water down through that swale till we could get some cover crop established. Looks like this in another angle. You can actually see where there had been the start of a wash down through that swale and we had to take remedial measures, remedy measures to make sure it didn't get worse. Here's another situation. The red arrow is pointing to a standpipe at the bottom of this slope. And there it is a little closer. So imagine water running down this slope during a big heavy rain and it would continue down that slope if it weren't for a berm that was placed right here to collect that water so it wouldn't just keep running downhill and create a lot of erosion. If we look at it from a different angle, the yellow line shows that raised berm and we've got a standpipe just uphill from that berm so that water would pond more or less like this and then it goes down the standpipe and the yellow lines are supposed to represent the underground tile that takes the water from the standpipe and safely lets it flow downhill underground rather than eroding. You just need to think about the erosion of whatever rainfall you're dealing with in your vineyard and you can get help at times from conservation people who will give you some good ideas on how to handle various situations. Here's a schematic with a sodded waterway, a depression at the top of the vineyard that's going to prevent water from uphill coming into your vineyard and washing your vineyard and it may be useful to put an underground tile from that sod waterway with standpipe at the top, carry the water underground safely below the vineyard and then release it with another standpipe like this. Just different options for you to think about what are you going to do in the design of your vineyard to prevent water from eroding 
your vineyard site. Well, this is a remedial measure that uh, I came upon in another vineyard. This vineyard washed badly, and the grower, in an effort to make sure it didn't continue to happen, hauled in many, many truckloads of these fairly good sized stones to break up the water flow. And it did stop the erosion. But you can see this isn't really the most desirable way to fix the problem because the water still runs over the surface and it really is not conducive to good vine growth. So we, we've stopped the erosion, but now we have an area that really isn't all that useful for growing vines. The better solution would be to take that water underground and then release it downhill. Okay, the third consideration I'm bringing up when you design your vineyard site is whether or not you're going to have irrigation. Most of the vineyards that I have been involved with through my lifetime have not been irrigated, but some have. And this is a vineyard we planted a few years ago, and we did want to irrigate this site. And you need to plan that. You need to design for this header line going up from the water source. And here it is before we put it in the trench with the lateral lines for each vineyard row installed in that header line. And then we just can lift that uh, PVC pipe in its entirety, place it in the trench and cover it all part of the design of the vineyard before you get started. Number four. Oh, here we go. I put this in to de determine your vine count as part of vineyard design because at the time you're designing the vineyard, it's the time you should start thinking about ordering vines. Don't think you're going to get the best vines a week or two or one or two months before it's time to plant. You really need to put your order in to get quality vines as much as a year in advance. So when you're designing your vineyard, think about how many vines you need to order. So we're going to go through a, a set of calculations, if you will, on deciding what factors influence your vine count. And the first one is row width. You've got to decide what is the width of your row as part of your vineyard design. The classic approach to this is published by Richard Smart here, and we, we acknowledge this schematic from Richard's publication, is to make sure that your row width does have at least a one-to-one -one ratio to the height of your trellis like this. So let's look at a couple of examples. This is Larry Mauby up in the Traverse City, Michigan area showing people his vineyard. And you notice how short the posts are? They're only about five feet high, these vines. So if you're planting something that short, if you can work it, you can put the width of your rows five feet apart and keep that one-to-one -one height of the trellis to the width of the row in this situation. On the other hand, at the MSU Southwest Research Center, uh, I like to plant eight-foot high trellises that I often train to Scott Henry training and if I have eight foot tall trellises, I typically plant nine foot wide rows. And that still keeps the one to one ratio of trellis height to row width in check. Here's the Scott Henry system that we put on here. And where then we take some leaf removal and this is what we have on eight foot trellises a lot. If you're interested in the Scott Henry and haven't looked at it, you can go back to great video nine. 
So, if you have a home planning, as I've said in an earlier video, and you're going to work it with uh, a garden tractor, maybe you want rows that are only five and six feet wide as long as you can get down through it. And maybe you're going to have a trellis then that's five to six feet high. But you have to decide row width as part of your vineyard design so that you can determine vine count. Now we're going to move on to vine spacing and oh my gosh what a big topic that is. You know there are growers who have been growing vines for 40-50 years who still agonize on what spacing they're going to use for their vines in their next planting. This is a topic that is never really one that someone is comfortable with and there's no single answer for all vineyards. I'm sorry if I get too complicated, we'll try to keep it simple, but we're going to go through a little discussion on vine spacing because you need to know that when you calculate your vine count. Okay, let's start out this way. A vine can be too small for its space. That is to say, we might have six or eight feet of trellis, two meters of trellis, plant a vine, and it does not fully utilize that space that you've allotted for that vine and you will lose productivity and waste trellis space. Well, a vine can be too big for its space and there can be too much vine trying to occupy the space that you've allowed for it. Look at this situation. Oh my gosh. Here is a Cabernet Franc vine on a 5C rootstock on a 6 foot vine spacing on a deep well-drained soil. What monster vines, what monster vines. These vines are only about five years old, but too much vine for the allotted space in my estimation. There is an optimum size of a grapevine for its space. I'm not going to go into it in length, but there is an optimum size. We'll talk a little bit about that. I'm trying to show you this picture to say here's, here's a situation with a somewhat optimum canopy where we can see through it. All the leaves are sun leaves. We do not have many layers. We have only a, a couple of layers of leaves. All the fruit is exposed. And this is my best effort to show you sort of an optimum vine density, if you will. So the viticulturalists calculate numbers. I'm not going there right now. We're just going to say what you're trying to do is to accommodate all these factors that I've listed here that can influence the ultimate size of the vine that you plant. And you see how many factors there can be, and probably more. These are just the ones I thought of. And they all have a bearing on the ultimate size of your vine. Because your task is to take into account all those factors that will determine a vine's mature size, and then plant vines on a spacing that will achieve the optimum vine size that ideal canopy that I tried to show you in the pictures where you've got a full trellis but not so excessively full that you can't see through the vine that not so large that you can't see into the vine and it's so dense like I showed you a picture not so small that half of the trellis doesn't have any vines uh, associated with it at all you want to get a trellis that is just nicely filled with a couple of layers of leaves and well exposed fruit. It is not true that the larger the size of the grapevine the more productive it will be. Leave it at that. We can get vines so large that they lose their fruitfulness 
that they produce poor quality fruit that is so buried in piles of leaves that you're really doing yourself a disservice. And it is not true that the more vines planted per acre or per hectare, if you will, the more productive and the better the quality of the grapes produced. And oh my goodness, it has to be said that at times people buy vines by what they read in an area that has an entirely different nature to its growth pattern. They buy lots of vines because the person who is selling the vine says plant high density you'll be really happy with the results so double the number of vines per acre and you'll have the most wonderful vineyard and this is not true so all i can tell you because i don't know who you are i don't know what country you're in what the conditions are of the growth of your vineyard. But if you're planting vines for the first time, a good starting point on deciding vine spacing is to look at the history of vine spacing and vine size at vineyards in your area. And that's the best I can tell you. I could give you some numbers, but I really wouldn't be fair to you to say plant at this spacing because I have no idea what you're dealing with. But be very careful about your choice of vine spacing and don't think that the closer you plant vines is always going to be better. It may be a disaster. So I've got to leave that for now and go on to, in order to determine the vine count, you need to measure the area to, to be planted. So. It's often a good idea to make a map. It's not essential, but it's good to make a map at times so you can see on paper more clearly what you're gonna do. This is a, an old time gadget that we use to measure the distances without using a measuring tape. And uh, this measuring wheel goes around and records the number of revolutions and we can calculate distances that are close enough for our calculations. But I do know that some of my most up-to-date growers now use GPS for establishing the coordinates. Oh wow, that's, that's pretty dazzling technology. One way or another, you've got to take some measurements. And it could be with a measuring tape, a measuring wheel, or GPS. Okay, let's say you've measured the area to be planted so you have some numbers and now it's time to calculate the vine count so you can place an order for vines. Let's take a straightforward, simple situation. Here we have a, an area that we've decided to plant. It's 120 feet long from one end to the other to where we put our stakes about the area to be to be planted and it's 63 feet wide now i'm going to make some assumptions you've had to make some decisions based on what we've been talking about i'm going to make the assumptions here that the row width is going to be nine feet wide well there they are we'll make another assumption that the vine space is six feet so if we calculate 120 feet divided by six feet per vine that's 20 vines in a row and 20 vines times eight rows is 160 vines that simple order the vines let's go about this in a different way to show that when you've got an irregular shaped piece of ground, you might need to do something a little different. But we'll still use this rectangle and we'll say the row width again is nine feet. And keep in mind that the space occupied by the vines in the row we've now colored orange is 
halfway on either side where the vines are planted. So here we have a rectangle just like before and those outer two rows actually occupy some space outside the corner stakes that we've put for this rectangle. They actually occupy this area in purple and half of that area is to the outside of those posts. So we have to accommodate some extra area and it calculates like this. The additional space outside of the corner stakes is one extra row width of 9 feet times 120 feet long or 1080 extra square feet. So when we have these two assumptions in place we can calculate that each vine is going to occupy 54 square feet, 9 times 6. And the total area occupied by vines is going to be that rectangle, 63 feet times 120 feet, or 7,560 square feet. But we have to add that extra space outside those stakes that we already calculated. That comes up to 8,640 square feet. And we divide that by the area per vine, 54 square feet per vine, and we came up with the same answer, 160 grapevines needed. What if we don't have a straight rectangular planting area? What if we have something like this? We could take that area and divide it into a rectangle and a triangle, calculate the area, and go through the same calculations that I just went through of how many square feet per vine and come up with the amount of vines needed. Here are some bundles of vines. When you purchase vines and or order them based on the vine count that you'll calculate, I suggest that you order at least 2% more because some of the vines may not be that desirable or they're going to be below the quality you want or you're going to have some die out or not do well in the first year. So if you order a couple percent more and you can just trench those in at the end of the last row between the vines, increase the density of the vines at the end of the planting, then next year when you need some extra vines to fill in where some haven't done well, you've already got them. You don't have to do a reorder. So order a couple percent more when you make this calculation. And most often you'll be glad you did that. And here's a bundle of 25 very nice vines with beautiful root systems. And you'll be ready to go. Well, that's all on this topic of vineyard design. We're going to have lots of videos coming up on the whole topic of vineyard establishment. We're going to get off talking about varieties in the upcoming videos, and then we're going to talk about site preparation, what you do to actually prepare the site. And then we're going to show you how you actually plant the site to the vineyard and what you do with it right after you've planted it. There's lots of things to talk about yet in the topic of vineyard establishment. So those will be upcoming videos that we're working on right now. But for now, we'll just thank you for your attention. And as always, we wish you happy grape growing.